do, we're going to move on to our, our first speaker, speaker then, which is uh, Eric Davison. Um, Eric was trained as a physicist and has worked for over 25 years in the oil industry as a petroleum engineer, living and working in six countries. Um, and he's the co-founder of um, Aberdeen Climate Action. Um, that started three years ago. Um, following in-depth technical work on carbon storage projects supported by the UK government from 2012 onwards, he noted the mismatch between what the governments are doing versus what society needs. Um, and in the spare time started looking into the true role of the oil industry um, rather than what is the common perception. In 2015, he presented an analysis of possible futures for Aberdeen um, and the industry at the DevEx Oil Show entitled Petroleum Energy and um, Uncertainty, Navigating the Crossroads Ahead. Last year, he added an, an analysis of the true risks to industry and society alike of postponing oil field um, decommissioning. Both went down very well, but uh, disappointingly, neither have made um, an impact. Um, last year, he set his base in the Canary Isles, and um, he's still supporting um, Aberdeen Climate Action. So, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. It's going to be a little bit technical, so if you can pay attention, there's four, almost five subjects that I'm going to tackle that will shed a little bit of light on what it is, um, on what it is I'm trying to bring up. The posters that I presented, which have some of the base material behind it and references and everything else can be found online but, uh, but if you're later if you're interested. First we look at a timeline, oil industry based. This is the money timeline of an oil project. Right? So at the beginning, the cash flow goes down, that's when you invest, when you construct a platform. At some point you start producing, so you get cash coming in, that's a positive bit. And then all the way at the end, you have this bit down below, which is the decommissioning. Now, the decommissioning is quite a chunk, as you can see the blue one. That's what we think now roughly the decommissioning cost is, which is about the same as the actual construction cost. The little dotted green line you see there is what, at the time that we built these platforms, we thought the decommissioning cost was going to be. Yeah, so it's already increased by, an order, by a factor of five. But because when you do industrial projects, there's a thing you use, which is a discount factor. And what that means is you basically have a way, this is basic economics, of making money now worth more than in the future. And when you apply that to this, so that's one too many, then you see the discounted cash flow. Yes, you make a little bit more profit in the middle, but the decommissioning cost, and this is based on a high decommissioning cost, gets much smaller. So you don't have to worry about it because that's 20 years away, 30 years away. Okay, so the red line is cumulative discount cash flow. Basically, you add it up, and if you see the bid at the end, that's the total amount of money you've made out of this particular project, including the decommission. Now, we draw, draw a little line in. The end line, you draw back to the green arrow. Where they intercept, that's the kind of critical point. And as you can see, for a typical oil project, that's about 10 years before the decommissioning date. That's the point where you don't make any money anymore. Yeah, that's really important to know. So. Companies that buy old oil fields, be careful on what their motives are, because there's no money inherently in the field if the decommissioning is taken into account. Unless, and there are two, two tools that oil companies have to still make money after that point. One of them is postponed decommissioning, because the further it moves into the future, the less value there is. It's discounted cash flow. And the other one is get someone else to pay. You can't make it cheaper. A lot of the oil industry talks about, oh, well, we can't start the doing decommissioning. We've got to do more studies because we've got to make it cheaper. You can't make it cheaper. The longer you wait, the more expensive it gets. That's one part of the oil industry timeline. I'm going to do a little bit on the climate change timeline. And they'll fit together in the end, you might see. If you've looked at climate change, you've seen this plot before. This is from the IPCC 2014 report. It's our global emission since about 1800. 1950. Um, just out of interest, you see the emissions increase just about here is 1989 where we knew that climate change was potentially a really big issue and that this was what was causing it. At that point, even Margaret Thatcher stood up in the UN and tried to persuade the, the heads of state there to do something serious about climate change because it was a big issue. Now, since then, the emissions have roughly doubled 
from the point where we are now, which is the, roughly the end of this graph, a couple of years afterwards, still going in the same direction, there are two general trends. One of them is the line which the oil companies think we're going with our emissions. And most of these emissions are from um, burning carbon fuels. The oil companies have one, and that's what is in their books. That's what they use for making strategies. It's what determines their share value. And there's another path going forward, which is what the United Nations thinks, which basically all the countries, all the governments together support. And to give you an idea, this is how far they are apart. The United Nations reckons that by 2050, 2060, we need to be about at zero emissions, zero net emissions. Oil companies assume by 2040, we'll have doubled our emissions, we'll be at 80 gigatons a year, just from national increase. What that means is that that yellow block there is the difference between what the oil companies pretend their market value is and where we need to go. What that means is that if we want an earth to live on, there's only one possible outcome, that's the oil industry must disappear. Um, if you, on the next subject, if you look at the oil industry as a business itself, which I've also done separately, and instead of just saying, okay, well, I'm looking in the oil industry and we do oil and nobody else does oil, so we're cool. If you look from the inside out, then there's some substantial risks to the oil industry. And I've taken the three largest ones, or the ones I see, energy price, carbon demand, and disruptive trends. And all three of those are conspiring together to make the oil industry disappear. Uh, the energy price is pretty straightforward. This is plot. It's a little bit difficult to see. This is the uh, oil price, but it's converted to an energy price in uh, what is it, pounds per megawatt hour, dollars per megawatt hour, so that you can compare it to the price of solar, wind, offshore, um, centralized uh, solar. <coughs> All that stuff. I presented this about two years ago. The date is three years old, and you can see um, oil level price here, fifty dollar equivalent. We've got solar PV, low, low range. They, they come in different costs. Wind, hydro is roughly there. Offshore wind is about there at the moment. Offshore wind is down here already, and the other ones are dropping as well. Solar since then dropped by about forty percent in cost for long industrial scale. So what is happening is oil is no longer the cheapest energy source. And that's a huge thing, of course, because oil is on an increasing timeline from a cost perspective, whilst the other energy sources are still on the decreasing timeline. Okay, the carbon demand I go, won't go into, but that's you know, another, another point. Disruptive trends, very quickly. Typically, when you look at historical disruptive trends, and whether that's uh, car transport, uh, washing machines, the internet, all that stuff, it doesn't really matter. They all follow the same line. By the time you've got about 10% of the market, within 10 years you end up with over 60% of the market. That works for all of these trends. And that's about the level where we are with a lot of renewable energies. It's the level where we are with different electrical transport. It's where we are with a lot of the, uh, the energy networking. So that is also going to happen in that same time span. Okay, take a back st step back to the oil industry and the decommissioning. Who pays for the decommissioning? In the UK, 70% of that is paid for by the government, by the taxpayer. Um, the total amount, the government estimates, as in the Oil and Gas Authority, estimates it will be about 40 billion. I made my own estimate that just before their estimate came out, using the same input data, but just using the rules of thumb that the decommissioning industry actually uses to estimate the cost of their projects. And I came up with a cost of about 400 billion. I've cross-checked that with a few of my technical colleagues <clears throat> who come to a similar order of magnitude. They come to between 200, somewhere there. Anyway, it doesn't really matter whether it's 40 or 400, it's a hell of a lot of money which needs to be paid, and that's the important bit, the decommissioning is more optional. Right? So the government is going to pay 70% of it, the other companies still pay 30%, which is still a big number. They're trying to shed that either by shedding the liability or by postponing the whole thing. The government is also trying to avoid this massive cost. And they have only one tool, and that's postponing. And there's evidence for, for both of these. Uh, what that means, and be short out of time, we'll just uh, <coughs> polish that off later. Anyway, to try and take these into the context of what is possible for Aberdeen, I think if you just look at this total employment, it's completely imaginary, except that, of course, this 
is pretty much real because we lost between 10 and 20,000 20, jobs over the last two and a half years. Where we are now, oil needs to go. You know, it's already on the decline. If you let oil go down in a controlled way, and the government can do that, both by controlling subsidies and because the government controls who's allowed to run the license and what you're allowed to do with the license, the government can decide what the oil companies can do. If you take that down in a controlled way over, say, 10 years, then in the same time, you can convert the jobs to decommissioning over that period of time. So you don't need any job losses because the decommission is a 20 year project. It's a lot of money, but it's a lot of time too. You can build up the decommissioning with the same staff. And in parallel, you can start to think about what kind of future do you want for Aberdeen? <coughs> what kind of no carbon, non carbon industry or, or jobs do you want to get into Aberdeen? And because you've got the decommissioning, which has to be done, you cannot avoid it, you may as well start thinking about that now, and then you've got 10 years to actually come up with something useful. And because you can plan that, that's a fantastic way to actually do an industrial conversion. Much easier than the steps that we had in Aberdeen's history with converting from the fisheries, which was more triggered by the oil industry, but before that converting from the whale oil. Because every industrial transition tends to come with collapse. Because of the decommissioning, you've got the option to actually do it right. For me, in summary, oil must end. I think it will. It has to. The decommissioning must be done, and I think that's really important for the future of Aberdeen. And I think the future that we need to build is a non-carbon future. Now, the one critical point I want to make, and that's the source of what I see as the issues. Why, would, why isn't this obvious to everybody? And it's because the experts we have who are deciding our strategy are people, are experts, but they're experts on our carbon past. And they are not people who have any understanding of our potential future. And they also typically have tremendous financial incentives to continue the current future. And I'd like to leave it at that. Thank you.